so nice to have you back, Larry, on this podcast. We got we we've got to quit meeting this way so frequently. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Let's get started with what's going on right now between Israel and Hezbollah. We will with these new attacks on the part of Israelis. It seems that they were trying to kill Nasrallah. And the Israeli media is talking about that the mission was successful. Iranians are talking about that he's in a safe place. And but it doesn't seem that they could achieve their objective. It that was the main objective objective of this bombing in Beirut. And here is what the Israeli IDF the IDF was talking about the main objective of this attack and how did how they did that. It's a go. The Israel Defense Forces carried out a precise strike on the central headquarter of the Hezbollah terror organization that served as the epicenter of Hezbollah's terror. Hezbollah's central headquarter was intentionally built under residential buildings in the heart of the Dachia in Beirut as part of Hezbollah's strategy of using Lebanese people as human shields. On October 8th, Hezbollah started attacking Israel. After almost a year of Hezbollah firing rockets, missiles, and suicide drones at Israeli civilians, after almost a year of Israel warning the world and telling them that Hezbollah must be stopped, Israel is doing what every sovereign state in the world would do if they had a terror organization that seeks their destruction on their border, taking the necessary action to protect our people so that Israeli families can leave their homes safely and securely. Yeah. He reminds me of Admiral Kirby. <laughs> They went to the same school of propaganda. And I listened to his entire briefing earlier, and I've got to tell you, I just listened to Netanyahu at the United Nations live. Um, it was all I could do to keep listening to Bibi Net Netanyahu and his little cheering squad that he had up there. He had to bring in a cheering squad because the seats in front of him were pretty much empty. Um, but the lies that he told, the obfuscations that he forwarded, and I, I take the same thing with this gentleman. How dare he say that every nation in the world confronted with a terrorist organization like Hezbollah would go about killing men, women, and children indiscriminately the way the Israelis have, not just in Gaza, but in Lebanon too. How dare he say that? How dare he insinuate that? But he did, just as Kirby tells his lies all the time from his podium in Washington. Yeah. We have the same comedy and tragedy at the same time, the way that Netanyahu was talking about Israel seeks peace. At the yes. same time, he was just giving the order to bomb Beirut. And Larry, is there anybody in Washington talking to him and making him understand what would be the outcome? What would be the consequences of this type of attitude on their part? If they, because they have assassinated the head of Hamas, the military head, and the political, the the the, the, the political part yeah. of Hamas, it was yeah. Ismail Haniyeh. And right now, if they, it seems that they want to kill Hassan Nasrallah. What would be the outcome for them? Because well, first of all. We found out, Nima, we found out that killing terrorist leadership is often the wrong thing to do. <laughs> For example, when we essentially got rid of bin Laden, the number two man had been running it for some time, and he was more vile and smarter, probably in a strategic sense, an operational sense, than bin Laden. So you take out a head and what you get is number two or number three or number four because they are not going to stop. Israel's philosophy, Nima, is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. All that produces is a world of blind people who need a dentist. That's all it produces. You never cut the head snake off the way Netanyahu talks about and expect that there's gonna be an end to the crisis an end to the ideology, an end to the people who hate you. It's ridiculous. 
And then the other aspect of what he said at the UN and what was being insinuated right there is that they are going, well, first of all, that they defeated Hamas. They have not. They have not defeated Hamas. Netanyahu says 24 battalions, I think, and we've defeated 23 of them. Hogwash. Hogwash. Show me the number. Show me the body. Show me the coffins. Tell me who was what and what was whom. And show me. Because I know he's lying. He's lying through his teeth. There's still a formidable Hamas force confronting them. And they're finding that out every day that goes by. The same is going to be true with Hezbollah. They haven't even begun to dent the capacity of Hezbollah. Not to mention the fact that Iran now seems to have convinced itself, at least rhetorically, that if, Hez if Hezbollah is really existentially threatened and going down, then Ar Iran is going to take action on its own. Um, so we don't, we haven't even seen that yet, and we haven't seen the reprisal that Iran promised. And I am convinced that they're going to deliver in their own time, in their own way, and when and where they think they'll have a high chance of success. So Netanyahu is courting Israel's destruction, as I've said many times before. He's courting its elimination as a state, not to mention the fact he did say one thing that was truthful. He counted the fronts that he's he's on now. I think he said seven, seven fronts against him. Well, Mr. Prime Minister, you're going to have nine or ten before this is over because you're exciting every Arab country in the region to finally stand up and take action against you. And if they do so in an, even a reasonably concerted way, you're going down and Israel's going down. I don't care what the United States does unless it goes there and plants 100 or 200,000 flags in Israel proper and says, if you come here to attack these flags, you're going to be attacking the United States. And oh, by the way, we will use our nuclear arsenal. That's the only way you're going to stop it. And I do not think that any American president is going to do that. And let me hasten to add. The polls are changing here. The polls are changing rather dramatically. I didn't think they would change this fast. Amongst independents, Republicans, and Democrats on both Ukraine and Gaza. That's opening political space. Kamala Harris has to know now. She's got to be smart enough to know that she is going to lose this election. In key decision states, she is going to lose because of Gaza. She is going to have to use that political space. She's going to have to talk this demented president into giving her opportunity to use that political space to begin to put some distance between her and the thug and killer and murderer and genocide creator in Israel. And she's going to have to do something with a less sense of urgency, but nonetheless, a sense of urgency about Ukraine. Because the percentages in both Democrats, Independents, and Republicans are topping 50, 60 percent now of Americans who want a ceasefire and a peace agreement. And the Americans are smart. I mean, in that sense, it's taken them a while, but they're coming around to it. They've got to respond to that political pressure. One of the things that Netanyahu did during this talk at the UN, he showed this picture, these two pictures, mm. the axis of evil and axis of good, if we can call it. And look, look, look at the picture, Nima. The curse is in the middle. The <laughs> curse is holding the two placards. Yeah. <laughs> Larry, what, um, what is he trying to do in your opinion by showing these two maps? He's trying to go back to the very argument he began to marshal at the, uh, at the, uh, I forget exactly when it was. It might have been in November when it when he was talking in order to keep the Saudis and others on board, as it were. He was talking about how Hamas had messed up the best deal that had ever been affected in the Middle East. There was going to be peace in our time. There was going to be prosperity for everyone because Israel was going to give its technological might and expertise and talent and skill to all the Arab states. And Saudi Arabia was leading the pack in that regard. And others were lining up like the Emirates and Qatar and others. It was going to be heaven forever, nirvana. Everything was coming that ne needed to come. And it was all because of Israel. And he tried to use that argument to put pressure on the Arabs to not come to Hamas's defense. And it worked for a while. Now he's lost them. He's lost them, I think, for I think the statement that they're making is 
indicative, but I don't think it's the full weight of how they feel and how they're going to have to act. The statement, of course, is that there must be two states. Palestine has to be an entity. It has to have a state. It has to be independent. It has to have its own ability to exist and such. Um, that, that's their requirement now before they'll come back into the fold, so to speak. Well, he's putting that argument out there again. He's saying, oh, look, if you'll just let us finish off killing all these people, destroying all these people, everything, let us settle Gaza, let us settle on the West Bank, let us settle East Jerusalem, just let us take control. We'll come back and be your buddies and, and everything will be peaceful. Everything will be peaceful. Of course, he's also saying something that he knows resonates with the United States, because if you want to look at that map he's drawn there, and you want to say who is really in a position to do what he's claiming Israel would do, you have to say it's China and the Belt Road Initiative and everything that that represents. You have to say it's China. And China has the wherewithal to do it, to build that sort of arc of connection that will put Europe and the Far East and the Middle East and Central Asia in connection, prosperous connection. China has the power to do that. Now, that's appealing to Washington. Indirectly, that's appealing to Washington because that's why Washington's in Ukraine. That's why Washington is trying to derail China in Ukraine. That 16-hour railroad from the Pacific ports into the heart of Europe, that's why they did Nord Stream 2. That's why they blew up the pipeline. That's why they severed the German connection with Moscow. That's why they're waging war. Part of the reason they're waging war, money's the other reason, in Ukraine. They fear, they fear China. And putting that up there sort of says to the United States, oh, just help me, protect me, keep me safe, and I'll do what China would do, but I'll be your bud. Many people are asking, Larry, that why Hezbollah is not responding to Israel. And here is what the vice president of Iran was talking about, the reason. Zarif. 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 Restraint when Israel uh, to, uh, op uh, conducted military operations against Iran, conducted uh, terrorist operations, killing uh, the leader of uh, Hamas, uh, who was uh, attending the inauguration of our president, of all things, uh, and we exercised restraint. We believe that Hezbollah is capable of defending itself. It has been exercising restraint in not doing so. It is uh, the responsibility of the international community to come in before Hezbollah has to take its defense into its own hands, and uh, maybe uh, the situation will get out of hand at that time. The Israelis have said that this offensive is to separate Hezbollah's... Yeah, just... Larry... Uh, you, didn't, you didn't give me a chance to comment on Christiane Amanpour and her prejudice. <laughs> <laughs> she was getting ready to show it. <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah, let me, let me play... Iran okay. has influence with Hamas as well. Are you trying to get Hamas to agree to a ceasefire? Well, I, I think Hamas has agreed to a ceasefire. It's been Netanyahu and the Israeli government who have refused all along, even refused the calls by the United States to engage in ceasefire. Who has been vetoing resolutions in the Security Council calling for ceasefire? Has it, has it, has it been the supporters of Hamas or the United States supporting Israel? So uh, even the claim uh, that uh, somebody needs to push Hamas to accept ceasefire uh, is, is ridiculous because everybody knows that Netanyahu uh, depends on this war in order to continue to survive. And uh, Israel has conducted this war with the hope, with the illusion of uh, winning this war, which is impossible. Yeah, <laughs> he, he thinks that- Zarif, is, a, Zarif is pretty much describing the situation. Now, what he didn't talk about was Nasrallah and other leadership associated with Hezbollah's dilemma. They do have a dilemma. They wish to be an integral part of the political structure in Lebanon. If they were to go after Israel with full force, maybe it would be existential for them in terms of their ultimate survival. I think it would be existential for Israel too. So it'd be a mutual suicide, if you will. But certainly Hezbollah will compromise any opportunity that it has to restore its political legitimacy and its political position which was getting fairly powerful in Lebanon. 
And they don't want to do that. They do not want to do that. And they realize that if they go full force against Israel, they will not only probably threaten their existence in a real significant way, even though they might take Israel down in the process, they'll threaten their future, entirely threaten their future. You know, a lot of these organizations, and Hezbollah was looking a lot like one. I don't care what Netanyahu says. He's a liar. He's a patent liar. A lot of these organizations, once they get political power, real political power, they morph. They turn into real political entities and they lose their terrorist aspects. Look what's just happened to Jamaa Islamiyah in Indonesia. They've just surrendered. They've given up their uh, terrorism. They've sent parties into the jungles, literally, to train and educate their people so they back away from terrorism. That has a tendency to politicize these movements. And once they're politicized and they have some power and they can feel that power in the political process, they cease being terrorists. One would say that that's the way Erdogan survived. The Muslim Brotherhood was the start of all of that. Um, so that's a positive process, I think, and that's the only real way you get rid of terrorist ideologies, is you get them to change. You get them to become political, to have political power, to share political power, and to be in the process and feel like they're represented. That's the way you get them to change. That's anathema to Bibi Netanyahu because that threatens Israel. They need enemies, Nima. They need enemies. We've learned, Larry, that Israel is sending two, berg two brigades and several battalions to the border close to Lebanon. Do you see any sort of chance of having a war on the ground with Lebanese, between Israelis and Lebanese? It could happen. I think it might happen in the south. I don't think it'll happen in Lebanon proper because the Israelis would be like they were in 82, 83. They'd be incredibly surrounded and buried very shortly. It's not like Gaza. It's not, it's not like, you know, you just go out there and kill babies and women and so forth. There's a lot of people who will oppose them as guerrillas and such in Lebanon. And you don't want to get in those mountains and you don't want to get incarcerated in Lebanon, as it were. Um, so they might go into the south. Um, I think they did that, in, if I recall, in 2006. And they said it was a victory. And in fact, they got kicked out. Um, and they want to establish a buffer zone, as I understand it, so they can push things into a bit and move their people back in. Because that's becoming very destabilizing in Israel all those people not being able to return to their homes, the next move they're going to make is a plane ticket and I'm out of here. And Netanyahu doesn't want that to happen. When, when Israelis start in mass leaving Israel, the experiment's over. Larry, do you feel that, because when it comes, you, you talk about Christiane Amanpour, she was in this talk with, in this interview with Zarif, she was asking about October 7th. And the problem is with their rhetoric, it seems that everything started on October 7th. There yeah. is no history. There is no, yeah. no background for this conflict. Here is what That's Zarif said. Larry. Yeah. Seventh last year, Hamas created atrocities by invading Israel proper and killing civilians. And I remember after the 2006 Hezbollah-Israel war, Hassan Nasrallah said that if he knew the result of what would have happened, you know, after he essentially took actions that created that war, he never would have done it. I mean, Lebanon was devastated. It was terrible. Do you think that was, do you support what Hamas did against civilians in Israel, against children, women? But nobody supports actions against civilians and Hamas certainly has been on the record saying that it does not support such, uh, such actions. The history did not start on October 7th. Israeli atrocities in Gaza, uh, basically putting a huge number of people in the most populated uh, place on, uh, on the face of the earth, in an open prison for so long, depriving them of, uh, any, of access to anything, basically, to basic necessities. Uh, has been an ongoing process. Occupation of Palestine has been going on for 70 years. A system of apartheid, 
uh, in Palestine has been going on for many decades. So history did not start on October 7th. And it's not for us to decide whether uh, the price that Palestinians are paying was worth the fight. It's for the Palestinians to decide. And if you look at the polls in Palestine, Hamas's popularity has increased rather than decreased. Mm, it's, it's going down a bit. And we're hearing a lot of people in Gaza who are really fed up yeah, but, but, and who blame them too for bringing this terror on their heads, well, this hell. You see, you, you, there is a variety of opinion any, everywhere, but the polls indicate that the general popularity, both in the West Bank and in Gaza, has increased. So these are the realities on the ground. The Palestinians have to decide whether it was worth it or not, but it is for the international community to end this, to end this uh, vicious circle, which will never uh, be, which will never have a victor. Israel will never be able to win this war, period. And Netanyahu has to recognize this and understand it. Yeah. Netanyahu, uh, uh, Amanpour cannot give up her, just cannot give up her propaganda line. She just can't. She's, she's buried in it, just buried in it. Listen to the words, though. And I wish the reef had picked up on this a little more closely. Listen to the words of Amanpour. On October 7th, they kill women and children. They kill women and children. What the hell has Israel been doing for the past 10, 12 months? but killing women and children by the boatloads, by the truckloads. And oh, by the way, on October the 7th, we now know Netanyahu was lying at the United Nations, lying through his teeth, and his cheering squad was there to cheer him when he said it. On October the 7th, the Israelis probably killed as many people with their incompetence as Hamas killed in the first place. It was very clear to me that what Hamas wanted to do was take prisoners back to exchange for prisoners that they had in Israeli jails who'd been there in some cases for almost their entire lives, 15, 16 years under horrible conditions, some of which have been exposed, but the Western press has not picked up on it very much. Horrible conditions, Abu Ghraib times 10. They wanted to exchange the hostages they took for those prisoners. Why would they kill the hostages? Why would they want to kill the hostages? They did not. The Israelis killed them. They killed them in the incompetence of their reaction to the surprise attack. So Netanyahu is lying through his teeth. Amanpour is lying through her teeth. The real killer here, the arbitrary breaker of all humanitarian law, is Bibi Netanyahu and the IDF, not Hamas. Now, what Hamas did, we could say, on that day was tragic. But oh, by the way, if you wanted to advance the argument, Nima, you could say that Israel did not have the right of self-defense. You could say that and you could argue it in a court of law because what had Gaza and the rest of the territory occupied by Israel become? An open air concentration camp. They are violating every day the rules in regard to occupying powers under Geneva. They never discharged their responsibilities as an occupying power. They were a crucifying power. They were a concentration camp running power, just as the Nazis were in Warsaw, just as the Nazis were in Treblinka, in Dachau, in Auschwitz. They were doing that to the Palestinians. You have a right under international law if you are occupied by a foreign power and they are oppressing you to attack them, to attack them with any means that you can muster. So Hamas had every right to attack the Israelis for violating their responsibilities as an occupying power. Not for a year, not for two, not for three, for 20 freaking years. This is a preposterous situation that the United States perpetuates with its hypocrisy. And that is the real crime in this situation with regard to the empire. We are hypocrites and we perpetuate this hypocrisy in order to protect the biggest killer on the face of the earth. Larry, why we cannot get to the roots of the conflict? Why the media is not interested in telling the story the way it is, not the way that it started from October 7th? And what's been in for the media? They've been brainwashed and they're being paid very well. Thank you very much. They're being paid very well. I watch, I think I told you the other day, I watched Shock and Awe again. The, the really good uh, Rob Reiner movie about the run-up to the second Iraq war and about WMD in Iraq 
and the only newspaper chain that got it right, Knight Ritter, gone now. But the reason Knight Ritter stuck to its guns is because they had independent journalists who refused to sing George W. Bush's patent line. They refused to deal with Dick Cheney. They looked into the CIA and they saw what Dick Cheney had done to the CIA. They saw that he had corrupted the entire U.S. intelligence system. They reported on that. We don't have that anymore. They're gone. What we have is a media that is like the New York Times, who published an apology, an apology after the Iraq war for contending that Saddam had WMD. They're like the New York Times today. All our mainstream media is that way. They're bought and paid for. And the bought and payer, the people who provide the money, are the Jewish American billionaires who support APAC. Larry, recently Donald Trump was talking about this attempted assassination that they, the people who were trying to kill him to assassinate him, and he was he says that he has some sort of he has found some sort of connection to Iran, and here is what he said: Two assassination attempts on my life that we know of, and they may or may not involve but possibly do Iran. But I don't really know, can't be sure, because in the first case in Butler, Pennsylvania. Yeah, and here is what Zarif said addressing this. I want, I want to move more broadly. I want to talk about the U.S. We have elections coming up because there have been allegations that I need you to be able to respond to uh, on the record. Um, which is that former President Trump has said that he has been briefed by U.S. intelligence officials. His campaign announced they were, they were briefed by U.S. intelligence officials on real and specific threats by Iran to assassinate Trump in order to destabilize the United States. I, I, I have to give you the opportunity to refute Well, those the claims. Iranian government has refuted that officially. And I once again refute that. We don't send people to assassinate people. Uh, I think that's a, a campaign ploy uh, in order to uh, get uh, former President Trump out of the, uh, well, not so favorable situation he's in uh, in the elections. But it's not for me to decide who is going to win in the American elections. That's for the American people to decide. And. Uh, Iran uh, doesn't have a preference in, in this election. We don't exercise uh, intervention in the internal affairs of other countries, unlike the United States, which does that every so often. Uh, but we don't do that. Uh, we don't interfere in the, in the, in the U.S. elections. Uh, it's up to the American people to decide who will run their country. Yeah. Well, Zarif, Zarif is a fairly intelligent person. But he knows damn well that he's lying. Iran has dispatched people to foreign countries to kill its own dissidents who happen to be in those countries. <laughs> That's primarily what they do. They kill their own people. When they can't kill them in Iran and they go to London or they go to Buenos Aires, they send teams to those countries to kill them. Uh, so that, that's a bit of a nonsense uh, statement there, Zarif. But basically, he's right that the United States does the same thing. And the United States tries to influence other countries' elections. I don't think Iran, I, I really don't think Iran would go after Trump in this country. I think Trump is being exactly what Zarif suggested. I think he's being opportunistic. He's looking around. He said, oh, the American people really don't like Iran. I think I'll insinuate that they were trying to assassinate me. Maybe John Bolton, too. And of course, you can get someone in the U.S. intelligence community somewhere to verify that for you because they're willing to do it, thinking that soon you might be president of the United States. Oh, and if I do you a favor. You might do me a favor in turn when you're president. That's the old game. That's the old game. Because what's in it for Iran right now? He's official. The official Republican Party's candidate for the presidential election. And why Iran or Russia or China or any of these countries would be interested in this type of activities, which is domestic policy of the United States, Larry, at the end of the day, that wouldn't change anything when it comes to any of these countries. You're absolutely right. And I don't think they're that stupid to waste the resources and the assets when they have 
much bigger problems to deal with on us. We are doing a fabulous job of screwing ourselves up. No, no one needs to help us. Putin doesn't need to help us. Tehran doesn't need to help us. No one in the world needs to help us. Xi Jinping doesn't need to help us. Why would anyone want to interfere in a process that's so uh, malleable now and so broken and so screwed up? We don't have a choice, Nima, between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. We don't have a choice. Both are owned by the deep state, different aspects of the deep state, Peter Thiel on the one hand and George Soros on the other hand, or whomever you want to pick, Charles Koch over here, whatever. They all, and they all, all, without exception, are owned by Jewish billionaires and billionaires that support Jewish billionaires. And that's why APAC is so powerful and owns the United States. A person said to me the other day, how in the world can Bibi Netanyahu dictate to the American president? Ma'am, where have you been? I said, where have you been living? On a desert island or something? They own the Congress. They, they came, he came and spoke to the Congress to ovations, standing ovations, a record number of standing ovations. They own the United States. Israel, my friend, owns the United States. Okay, you got that? Now we'll talk about the situation and maybe you'll understand why it's so uh, prejudiced for Israel. That's the truth. And so why would anybody want to mess with us, really? Why would they waste assets, precious assets, to deal with us when they have other enemies and other threats they have to deal with? We are doing a fine job of committing suicide ourselves. Who needs to help us? How did you find the meeting between Biden and Zelensky and Zelensky's victory plan? You know, at the same time I was hearing that, in the other ear, so to speak, I was hearing that a 2,000-man Ukrainian br brigade was uh, surrounded at a place called Vuladar. I haven't even ha had a chance to look on the map. Surrounded and going to be cut off and killed to a man. Uh, this, is, this is just Russia ro wrapping up the front lines, wrapping up the front lines. Pretty soon Putin will have to stop because he doesn't want to take the, the whole of Ukraine and say, okay, I'm gonna sit here for a while, and if you pound me, I'll pound you back, and I'll pound you worse than you pound me because I got better rockets than you do, um, and wait until you come to the peace table, until you decide that you want a ceasefire and you want negotiations to start, because I've decimated the Ukrainian army. There's nobody left. In both meetings with Donald Trump and Biden, Zelensky was insisting that they're capable of winning the conflict, Larry. Is there anybody in Washington telling him, you, you're so delusional about what's going on in Ukraine? I think there are now. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing that there are people in the Pentagon, there are people in the White House, there are people elsewhere in the political apparatus around the White House that is looking at the elections coming up on both sides. Um, in terms of the Republicans, the RNC, the Republican National Committee, and they're saying things like, you, get, you need to get rid of that guy. You need to get him out of the equation. He's, he's just babbling. It, it, there's no way Ukraine is going to turn this situation around. And all you're doing every day is losing ground. And here's the key. Both parties, you're losing ground politically. You, you're going to see Trump talking more and more, I think, publicly talking more and more about shutting down Ukraine, completely shutting it down. The meeting with Zelensky and Trump was not too good. Not too good is what I'm told. And if you saw the body language of him in the little video you had, you could, you could see that. Trump was actually uncomfortable with him, I think. And that's odd for Trump to be uncomfortable with somebody, especially someone he can exploit politically. So I think Zelensky's time is numbered, and I don't think it's in months. I think it's in weeks. Russians are talking about their new strategy in terms of the use of nuclear weapons. Do you think that would be enough for Washington to go after negotiations? I think any appearance that Biden has caved to what they have been saying, they being the president and his team, are totally baseless threats and that all he's doing is making threats. He's not anywhere near prepared to carry them out. That message has so permeated the political structure that I think it's going to be difficult for, for them to walk away from it precipitously. 
So it's going to have to be careful and over time that they walk away from it. I think one of the tools they can use, and they're recognizing that more and more so, is Zelensky. And I think we may be looking at a operation to get rid of Zelensky that's run by the U.S. CIA. Um, we may be looking at a, a, a Maidan II, if you will, or you know, a, another coup perpetrated by essentially U.S. intelligence services that essentially changes the leadership in Kiev and makes it more amenable to, uh, you know, oh, man, the leadership there wants to do it, so we have to do it too, that kind of thing. Um, and then and then we'll move into some sort of meaningful negotiations to get this thing shut down. Um, I personally, that might seem despicable, but personally, I wouldn't object to their doing that and getting it on and getting it done because we're just killing people for no reason other than the stupidity of the leaders on the NATO side of the equation, preeminently led by Washington. Just to wrap up this session, Larry, the main question of the title of this talk is are Zionists pushing for war with Iran? Yes. With, what we've, with what we've learned from Trump talking about Iran tried to assassinate him, do you think they're preparing Trump if he wins to make a bigger fight, make bigger war in the Middle East with Iran? I think that's a good uh, suggestion or, uh, by you. I mean, a good surmise by you. I think that is part of their problem or their plan. Um, I, I think they're going to. I think they're plowing uh, unfallow ground. Though. I, I don't. I watched Trump in his first administration, and although he did do some things that were, you know, braggable about in Trump language, uh, including killing the leader of the IRGC, um, he didn't want to go to war with Iran, and that was principally because the military leadership was telling him, "You don't want to do that." Believe me, Mr. President, you do not want to do that. We do not want to do that. Collectively, the Joint Chiefs do not want to do that. So you don't want to do that. And he listened. Um, that may have been one of the reasons that he called generals dumb and he was smarter than any general and everything else because he doesn't like to be told that sort of thing. But nonetheless, he restrained himself. I'm not sure that restraint would evaporate in a second term were he to get it. He'd still be reluctant, and so would the military for even more reasons now to go to war with Iran. One reason the military is reluctant is because they don't like to be prodded into a war they might lose by another country. And that's the way they look at it. We're going to war for Bibi. That's the way they look at it. And they don't want to do that. And I don't blame them a bit uh, for both reasons. They might lose the war. They most probably would if it were elongated and they had to call for a draft. Nima, if we call for a draft, 50% of the American youth eligible for that draft would disappear into Mexico and Canada the next day. We have fighter pilots who are leaving because they're looking at the statistics that would occur were we to go to war with China over Taiwan. And those statistics are that the war would be initially primarily air and Navy, and the attrition rates in the Air Force would be 32 to 40%. 32 to 40% of the planes would be shot down. They know what that means. Um, the Air Force is 2,000 fighter pilots short right now. The U.S. Air Force is 2,000 fighter pilots short. So the military is not going to do this kind of stuff. They, they're they're going to, you know, they'll follow the president's orders, but they will talk to him really hard about doing some of these stupid things. But ultimately, you're right to point at that because that's what BB wants. That's his ultimate ask of the United States of America is to eliminate for him Iran and particularly their their nuclear program. Yeah. I don't know if you listened to the president the other day, but he is very he is very interested, very interested in resuming the talks with us, just us. Not Russia, not China, not Germany, not the UNC Perm 5, just us and getting a new deal because he wants sanctions relief. He, he sees what it's doing to his people. Um, we could probably affect something if Gaza weren't going on right now and Lebanon and other things impinging on it. Because Netanyahu said, I have seven nations arrayed against me now, and they're all after me. You've got to help me. You've got to help me. Uh, I, don't, I don't think Israel's position right now is anything but untenable, and I think Netanyahu's going to take it to its suicide. I think he's intent on suicide, saving himself or suicide of his state. And one of those things is going to be affected, and i got a feeling it's going to be the suicide of his state. 
Yeah. Because the foreign minister of Iran right now, it was he was part of the team of Zarif, if you remember in those days. Right. And his these are the same team that came to power again, and they want a better relationship with the United States, especially with the yes. United States. Yes. And if Trump wins, that's gonna sabotage everything that they're planning for right now. Yeah, but you never know. You know, Nixon went to China. You yeah. just never know. Trump, if Trump is, if he's anything, and I, I, I really hesitate to say this because I'm not sure he's anything anymore. But if he is anything, he's transactional, and with that transactional nature comes pragmatism, not necessarily prudence, but pragmatism. And if he saw it were in his, uh, in his favor politically and otherwise, to suddenly be a Richard Nixon and to go to Tehran, as it were and affect a new agreement, my agreement will work. You know, that's what he'd say. That old agreement, that JCPOA, that was terrible. But my agreement, I got it. And it's good. So let's do it. That's what he'd say. Yeah, that could be as well. <laughs> Thank you so much, Larry, for being with us today. Great pleasure as always. Surely. Take care. Take care.